Hi everyone and welcome back to another video. So if you have seen any of my videos before, you may know that I, as an individual, am quite heavily critical of family channels on YouTube. On a personal note, they just don't appeal to me, but more importantly, I have huge issues with the way they exploit children and just post everything about their lives online without the kids being able to consent to it. One example of this type of family are the LeBrants, who currently have three children and a fourth on the way. Apparently they've been in controversies before for making it seem like their child had cancer to clickbait a video, which is just sickening, and for wanting to homeschool their eldest daughter so she can take on some of the childcare responsibilities for the newborns. This is just gross in my opinion. Stop having so many children if you can't look after them all and stop making children act like parents when they're still kids themselves. It's that simple, that's how I feel about it. But this video isn't about any particular parenting decisions the LaFrance have made, and instead I wanna focus on a video that they put out just last month titled Abortion brackets documentary. We're gonna be watching parts of this video today and reacting to it, fact checking it, and I will be sharing my own opinion as well, and we're gonna be talking about some of the science that they blatantly misrepresented or just chose to leave out. Now, to let all my biases out before we start this video and before we watch any of the LeBrant's, LeBrant's content, I am gonna say this, I am completely 100% pro-choice, and that is not gonna change. It has always been that way, it will always be that way. I have been incredibly vocal about this topic my entire life, but also just like since I started my YouTube channel as well and I have made quite a few videos on this topic. It comes up briefly in a whole bunch of videos but if you'd like to see the specifically pro-choice content I've made there are links to all the videos in this video's description. The way I formed my opinion around these topics doesn't come from religion or politics or societal pressures but from my understanding of science. What a lot of people don't realise when they see me making a lot of poetry content is that I actually studied biomedical science at uni for a year before I ended up changing my course um, and I'm actually really really good at biology. I didn't change because it was a difficult course, I didn't change because I couldn't do it, I changed because it's just not the direction I want to take my career in. I didn't fancy going on to do postgraduate medicine and that was the most common career path after that degree so I decided to switch to something which was going to be more useful in the long term and it was. Anyway the point is I'm actually really 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 good at science and very knowledgeable about it especially when it comes to human biology. About three years ago now I made a short video series with Holy Kool-Aid, who's another YouTuber, in which we looked at the science of pregnancy and how that related to abortion and the rights of pregnant people and unborn fetuses. It was really interesting stuff, again, very heavily science-based, so if you wanna check that out, they'll be linked in this video description as well, and also on a card somewhere on screen right now. Those videos do have full source lists and a whole bunch of further reading if you are interested. And as always, I try to pick resources that are accessible to everyone regardless of your education level so that pretty much anyone can understand the science regardless of what kind of background you have. So if you are interested in finding out more, they're a really, really good place to start without being overwhelmed by big, intense scientific papers. The, the science in them comes from, you know, reliable papers, but it's presented in a way that's a little more digestible. So that's me out of the way. That said, the LeBrant family are people who call themselves pro-life. However, I've said this before and I'll say it again, they're not pro-life, they're pro-forced pregnancy. They're anti-choice. They don't care about the person carrying that blastocyst or embryo or fetus. They don't care about the babies once they're born and they don't care about making sure all humans have the resources they need to survive, never mind thrive. And they absolutely do not care about other living things which are as or considerably more advanced or developed than a human embryo. They're not pro-life, they're pro-forced pregnancy. Simple as that. The other important thing to remember is that in the context of this video, I'm in the UK and I'm very lucky that our laws allow people to get legal, safe and free abortions, but the LeBrants are in America and something incredibly concerning is happening over there at the minute in that there is an attempt to overturn Roe versus Wade, which to put it very simply is I think like an amendment or a law which gave women total autonomy to terminate pregnancy during the first trimester. And then there are other rules and stuff in place depending on what state you're in for later abortions and so on. But later abortions only generally happen when the mother or baby is at risk or there are like serious complications and stuff like that. In the UK in particular, abortion can only be carried out to a certain stage and after that it's not legal unless the mother's life is at risk or the baby has serious health concerns and complications. But we'll get into all that stuff in detail later in the video. The point that I, I'm trying to make and I want you to remember as you listen to this entire video from Dull Brandt is that America 
is that a lot of American politicians are trying to overturn Roe v Wade, which is just the first step in several of their politicians' plans to, no exaggeration, ban abortion outright. That is the end goal for so many of these people, so many political parties, so many groups of people in America at the moment. Some states are already so messed up as you have places like Texas which ban abortion after just six weeks of pregnancy, which is insane because when you count the weeks of pregnancy, it's counted from the end of your last period, not from conception, which is a thing that a lot of people I don't think realize. So at that point, the embryo has only been growing for four weeks. It doesn't have the ability to survive outside the womb. It can't feel pain. It resembles a tadpole. It has no brain, never mind consciousness or sentience. And of course, most people, unless they're actively trying to get pregnant and testing constantly, don't even realize they're pregnant at that stage. It's very messed up. So as we watch this video from the LeBrant, let's be very clear that when viewed in context of the timing of the release of this video, this is undoubtedly political propaganda from the LeBrant to encourage supporting the ban and criminalization of abortion. They say later, oh, it isn't, it's still gonna be legal, we're not trying to do anything, but we're not idiots. They've released this at a very specific time with a very specific message, and it is undoubtedly propaganda, supporting criminalizing abortion, and that is not okay. This is something that is actively harming people and putting lives in danger. It's as simple as that, I'm not exaggerating. But for now, let's watch the video. Okay, first 30 seconds and let's immediately fact check this, right? The use of this sound effect over these images is entirely misleading and inaccurate because an embryo does not have a heartbeat during most of these images shown. Around four weeks into development, so six weeks of pregnancy, the embryo will develop some cells which start laying out a small electrical impulse. Um, over time, these cells may develop and specialize and grow and become a heart with muscle tissue and valves and chambers and so on. But at this early stage of six weeks of pregnancy, it is not a heart, it is not beating, it is not pumping, it's simply a small group of cells which are producing an electrical signal that is so weak it can only be picked up by specialized and sensitive equipment. Experts constantly remind us that the presence of an electrical impulse is not indicative of the viability of an embryo. Plenty of miscarriages still happen at this stage, many without the person even knowing they were pregnant. It is that common. And I just need to remind you as well that Electrical impulses in living cells are so, so common and they happen in many types of cells and we don't protect all of them. An electrical impulse in a cell doesn't make it special and need protecting. We have electrical impulses in our muscle cells, in our brain cells, in the cells of certain animals like eels. Platypus noses are known for having electrical impulses. Some plant cells are known for having electrical impulses, but would we ask an adult human to suffer and die and use their body against their will to save a platypus nose? I don't think so. So not only is the use of this heartbeat over these images incorrect and misleading, but it's all based around a premise that electrical impulses are somehow sacred, I guess, and need protecting, which just is not true, unfortunately. Abortion has been arguably the most polarizing, heated, and controversial civil rights issue since 1973, when abortion was legalized in the US. Okay, and so straight away, with the first little bit of speech in this video, we know that this is gonna be a totally US-centric video with no consideration for other cultures or countries all the problems that they have because there's no mention of how it was legalized under certain circumstances in 1967 in the UK for example or the issues that Ireland have had with abortion rights or how there are still so many countries around the world where abortion is still illegal. Look at this map. So I can see there being some issues with this straight away but okay they're American we'll give them a pass for focusing on their country, I guess, because yeah, let's not be too harsh. There is so much passion on either side of the topic and seems to be no middle ground and virtually no humane conversations. So much anger and so much hate. Okay, with this, I thoroughly, thoroughly disagree. I actually think most pro-choice resources I've seen are incredibly humane and reasonable. 
what's inhumane is the ridiculous clip they show at this point of a cartoon full-term baby being ripped from a womb with some kind of forceps. That's not representative of abortions at all. And I think it's kind of inhumane to show that as being, oh, this is what all abortions are because that's the message they're trying to get across here and it's way off but we're going to talk about types of abortion in detail later in this video so we'll get into that then. And I do disagree, I think there is a middle ground and the middle ground is allow abortions until the fetus is viable outside the womb or is sentient and until then you let the pregnant person decide what happens to their own body and if you don't like abortions don't have one. That is the middle ground. For me you have the forced pregnancy end, which is everyone who's pregnant should be forced to continue with the pregnancy no matter what. And then at the other end, you have the antinatalist view, which is forced abortions for all, no pregnancies. Urgh. Middle ground is pro-choice. It's, hey, make sure everyone has access to safe, legal, affordable, and accessible abortion, and then let people make up their own minds with what happens to their own body. That's the middle ground. Forced pregnancy and forced abortions are the opposite ends of the spectrum and they're both as bad as each other. Middle ground is letting people choose what happens to their own body. Simple as that. In the midst of it all, we truly believe that love is the answer. Instead of pro-life or pro-choice, is it possible for us to be pro-love? Is it possible for us to love both the mother and the baby? Maybe the answer isn't either or, but rather both. Yeah, I'm sorry, but there's nothing loving about forcing a person to give up their bodily autonomy for a being which isn't even sentient, or forcing them to suffer for months without their consent, and then to bring an unwanted child into an already overpopulated world where there are already millions of children living in poverty, who are malnourished, who are being abused and mistreated. How about we look after those first before forcing more children to be born to parents who don't want them just so they can go off to live in those conditions? That's not loving to me. Also, I want you to notice what's happening on screen right now. They're comparing genocide statistics to abortion statistics. It's revolting and unfair. These genocides involved the torture, rape, kidnapping, murder, desecration of corpses, theft of property, uh, people being treated like cattle, uh, people being experimented on, and just general dehumanization of sentient beings with conscious thoughts and emotions and the ability to feel and understand pain and feel fear. That's not the same as abortion. Abortion is the removal of a small bundle of unwanted parasitic cells, most often before they have any consciousness, before they can feel pain, before they're sentient without the ability to survive without a host. It's entirely different. If we're gonna compare stats in this way for like, ooh, dead living organism, dead living organism, you wanna make that comparison, then let's look at the number of other living organisms that we kill every single day. When we mow the lawn, we kill millions of living plant cells. When we take antibiotics, we kill millions of living bacteria. Fungi are multi-celled organisms that communicate with each other chemically and electrically. Oh my god, a little bit like an embryo. They're closer to animal than plant, so when we pick their fruit in bodies to eat them, when we take antifungal medications, all that stuff, we're killing living organisms with electrical and chemical impulses. On a mass scale, that is genocide, according to the Lebrants. What about when we get parasites like worms living inside us and we kill them? What about the millions of animals that we kill every day for hunting, for population control, for food? Most of those are considerably more advanced than a human embryo. They are conscious, they can survive without a host, they can feel and process sensations of pain. Should we compare those numbers too? And let's remember one more very, very important reason why it's revolting to compare genocide and abortion, and that's because no one goes into abortion lightly. No one has an abortion, oh, just because they can. That'll be a fun weekend activity, won't it? Usually it's because they don't feel they can raise a baby and they don't want to cause harm by bringing an unwanted human into the world. They have an abortion because they don't want to suffer through, through the absolute torture that is pregnancy. Often people who choose to have an abortion, they're preventing a sentient life coming into existence, ultimately to reduce their own suffering, to reduce their partner's suffering, and to reduce the suffering of a potential new human, and the suffering that will be caused by the strain of bringing that human into the world, the strain that will be on the economy, 
on social care systems, on healthcare systems, on the education system. Abortion is not a matter of this life is worth more than this life. It's saying a sentient life should have control over their own body, especially over a non-sentient life. When you take medicine to flush a parasite out of your system, you're saying that your life as an adult conscious sentient human being is more important than that of the parasitic worm living inside you because that's not sentient, that can't live without a host, that can't feel pain, so you're okay killing it. You're okay flushing it out of your system, you're okay getting it to leave your body, even though that's a living organism as well. So why is that okay, but removing an embryo isn't? But genocide is very, very different, and it's never about reducing suffering, it's never about making the responsible choice, it's never about doing what's right for you and the people around you. Genocide is hate-fueled and selfish and senseless and with the intent to hurt and wipe out as many people as possible. Genocide is about pitting equal sentient living beings against each other in the most revolting ways and it's never excusable. They are not equal, not even close. I have my personal convictions, you have yours. We're all so different and that's okay. See, they say this, but is it okay? Is it really? Because right now you and people like you, especially with the timing of when this video is released, videos like this and the people making them are actively attempting to take the rights that people like me have over our own bodies away from us. This isn't just a, I have my opinion, you have yours, and no. This is an active attempt to force us to go through a horrifically physically and emotionally and financially draining experience, pregnancy, all because of your personal convictions. Putting out videos like this isn't about offering people a choice, it's about shaming them into doing what you want them to do. If you really believe this, then you would support legalizing abortion and you would say that and you would be pro-choice and if it was just my convictions, your convictions, it's all okay. If you really, really believed that, you'd be like the rest of us pro-choices pro and say, well, it should be legal, it should be safe, it should be affordable and easily accessible, but it's up to the individual to decide whether they want one. Plenty of pro-choices say, I don't want an abortion, so I won't get one, but I believe people should have access to decide what's best for them in an environment that's clean, safe, legal, affordable, and non-judgmental. And then we get a personal story about how the wife and mother Savannah was scared when she got pregnant with her own kid at 19. And she's like, I know for me personally, my choice was always to keep my baby. Like, okay, I get it, you wanted a baby, but you were scared. And it's great of you to share your story and experience for others in the same situation, but you have to remember that not everyone is in that position. I was 19 when I got pregnant with Everly, and I remember just being so scared. And I didn't know what I was gonna do, I was actually, in school, in college, and I didn't, I was too scared to tell my family, I was too scared to tell my friends. It was just a lot for me to take in, being so young. I know for me personally, my choice was always to keep my baby, but I also know that for others, there are choices. Don't lose heart, it's strength. A lot of people don't get an abortion just because, oh, well, I was a bit scared. It's because they don't want a baby. It's that simple, or they, can't have a baby. It's very different to, I wanted the baby but I was scared. It's very, very different. And you have to remember that there are some people who have to get abortions who do want their babies, but for whatever reason the pregnancy isn't viable, like in the case of ectopic pregnancies. In an ectopic pregnancy, the fertilized egg implants itself outside of the womb, usually in one of the fallopian tubes. And in these cases, if an abortion isn't performed, then that fertilized egg will continue to grow in the wrong place and ultimately kill the mother. The person carrying that embryo will die and the embryo will die. There is no way to save that pregnancy. The only thing you can do is act to save the mother's life. That simple. And like I say, for many people, it's not just a matter of like, oh, I want the baby, but I'm a little bit scared. It's no. Some people know they cannot afford a pregnancy and to raise a child. They can't take time off work. They might not have any kind of family or partner. Maybe they have health problems that they don't want to pass on to a kid. What about addicts who are struggling to get sober and don't want to give birth to a baby that is going to be born with addictions? What about people who don't want the mental strain of pregnancy and childbirth, especially if they have ongoing mental health problems themselves? Pregnancy can cause all kinds of problems like postpartum depression or psychosis, to name just a few. And not everyone has a support system or even the healthcare system to help them through any of that. 
And it's not just a matter of like, oh, well, there are resources to help you through if you want. Some people don't wanna go through that at all. And that's absolutely okay. You shouldn't have to suffer just because there are resources there to help you. If you wanna choose not to suffer at all, you should be able to. That's like saying, oh, well, did you know there are resources to help people who are homeless? So we should all choose to be homeless. No. <laughs> and what about the people who don't want the physical strain of pregnancy? Because pregnancy isn't just this wonderful, beautiful, perfect thing that's like, oh, you just pop out a baby and then it's over with. Pregnancy is so much more than that. It can ruin your body. It can literally tear your body apart. Uh, some people lose their hair, their teeth, they get brittle bones while they're pregnant. It can cause God knows all kinds of health problems and heart problems and just so much can go wrong. The strain it puts on different women's bodies in different ways is insane. And some people just don't want to be parents. And to the extreme, some people are antinatalists, which means they believe it is morally wrong to bring new life into the world when that life hasn't consented to being born. So why is it okay for you to push your moral opinions on people and say, well, morally I think abortion's wrong, so you can't have one. But when the people say, well, I think morally it's wrong to bring a child into the world without them consenting, you say, well, your morals don't matter. My morals are more important than your morals. How is that fair? And then, of course, for some people, forcing them to continue a pregnancy that they don't want can bring back memories of sexual assault and trauma. It can cause bad gender dysphoria or body dysmorphic, dysmorphic disorder. There's just so so much that can be traumatic about pregnancy for different people. There are so many pe reasons why people don't want to continue with pregnancies rather than just, oh, well, I do want the baby, but I'm a bit scared. In America, over 2,000 abortions happen every day. Every day in America, 100 people die in car accidents. 1,300 people die from smoking. 1,800 people die from heart disease, the leading cause of death in the US, according to the CDC. But there's another, even more deadly killer than heart disease. By definition, abortion is when a pregnancy is ended so that it doesn't result in the birth of a child. Yeah, see, at this point, ending a pregnancy so it doesn't result in birth, that's not the same as killing a conscious, sentient, self-sufficient being. Not by a long shot. And, and you know what, in my opinion, is worse than ending the development of a non-conscious, non-sentient bundle of cells? It's the millions, millions of people who would harm themselves and kill themselves if abortion was made illegal and they had to continue with pregnancies they didn't want. I know if I was forced to go through a pregnancy, that would absolutely destroy me. I think I would rather kill myself than be forced to go through a pregnancy. I couldn't do that. Absolutely could not do that. No exaggeration. And it's not just the people who are pregnant who have to suffer because of that stuff. Back before abortion was made legal, you had people who were trying to perform at-home abortions and going to these dodgy backstreet clinics trying to get abortions, trying to do something to get rid of the baby, and they would take all these revolting medicines, or some people would shove knives or coat hangers or um, metal rods, basically anything sharp, inside themselves to try and kill the baby. and. Sometimes this didn't work. And quite often this would result in babies being born with disabilities, deformative, long-term health conditions and problems, and it would overall reduce their quality of life. And to me, that is so much worse than safely removing a bundle of cells before it develops any kind of sentience. Making abortion illegal doesn't stop abortion. It just puts pregnant people and unborn fetuses and embryos that these pro-lifers claim they care so much about, it just puts them at risk. Making abortion illegal only stops safe abortion. So as we've been filming this documentary, we've been asked by our friends, by family, by mentors, why are we making this? So there's so much at risk. Why are we even making this? Why are we adding flame to an already crazy burning fire? And the answer is just if one baby is saved from this. If one mom chooses to keep her baby from it, then it's all worth it. Mm -hmm. This documentary by no means is trying to illegalize abortion. After this documentary, you're still gonna have the choice. Yeah. You're still gonna have your choice. But I know that there's gonna be one mom watching, maybe five, maybe 10, maybe 100, maybe 1,000. We have no 
idea, the ripple effects. See, and then they say this here, but I, I disagree with them. Like I said earlier, the timing of this video and with what is happening with abortion laws in America right now, the LeBrants might not have the means to make abortion illegal themselves, but this video is undoubtedly propaganda in support of revoking these rights from people. Undoubtedly, that is what they're trying to do. So what happens during an abortion? In private practice, I performed just under 1,200 abortions, including first and second trimester abortions, up to 24 weeks of gestation. So I feel like one of the most important questions that everybody asks is when does life begin? And if we had a direct answer, then I feel like this wouldn't even be a conversation because if we could all agree that life began at a certain point, then abortion should be allowed before that point and not allowed after. Oof, okay, so I thoroughly disagree. And I think this sort of attitude shows a basic misunderstanding of biology. And I don't think it's this simple at all. I made a video on this topic a while back about what it means to be alive and can life come from non-life and how do we dis distinguish between living beings and non-living beings and also what does this mean for the abortion debate in general. And basically I looked at how there are so many different kinds of cells which are living which we don't mind removing from places and getting rid of and killing. We remove uh, living cancer cells, we amputate limbs, we remove parasites and fungi and bacteria, all of which are living. We mow lawns and prune bushes and we spray weed killer and pesticides and bug spray. We hunt animals, we kill farm animals for food, we grow fruit and vegetable and collect and eat them, all of which are living things. We don't hold all living cells to the same standard. And ultimately this shows to me that it doesn't matter when something is a living thing or not, that's not what matters. What matters is how we define what kinds of lives we value as individuals and this is incredibly complicated and to me you need a thorough understanding of human and animal and plant biology, just biology in general to be honest. Um, you need a thorough understanding of biology to be able to to be able to answer these questions about what we value and what is worth protecting and what isn't and you know I to me it comes down to things like is the living being conscious or sentient can it survive on its own or does it need a host can it feel and understand pain to what extent is it aware of its surroundings and so on and so on and there's a whole bunch of criteria and if you kind of want to learn more about that I'd recommend you go and watch this video of mine and if you want to find out more about specific embryo and fetal development and when it acquires these things then I'd go and watch my collab with Holy Kool-Aid because we go into detail about like how a fetus develops and you know when it develops consciousness and sentience when it can feel pain and, and so on uh, when it's viable outside the womb all those all those factors but even if we can like sit down and say well okay this life is valuable and this one is less valuable if you want to put it in those terms which sounds heartless but I don't really know how else to word it to get this point across but even if we sit down and we think about that stuff I don't think it's every single person's responsibility to maintain the life of every other living thing I just don't. I think that's too much to ask of anyone. Morally it might be the right thing to do but I don't think, and a lot of people might disagree with me on this, but I don't think every human needs to be morally perfect all the time. I think sometimes it's okay to be selfish and sometimes it's okay to do things just because you want to. By which I don't mean I think it's okay to actively do harm to other people but I do think sometimes it's okay to say you know what right now in this moment I don't want to do the most good I can I just want to get by. I think sometimes that's okay. And I don't just mean this for humans, but I mean it for like all living things as well, right? So if we look at an adult lion and an adult gazelle, both fit all those same criteria on my list for being the same kind of living things of the same value. Both are conscious and sentient. Both can sustain life without a host. Both feel pain, but I'm not gonna get mad and call it a moral outrage if a lion kills a gazelle to eat because that's kind of how nature works. And, you know, the lion's feeding to preserve its own life and the lives of those around it. So that's okay, that doesn't bother me, that's fine. However, I would get mad about a human hunting a lion, for example, or a gazelle or whatever, because it feels needless and senseless and cruel just for the sake of it. And I don't think that's helping anyone that's not someone doing something to sustain the people around them, you know? I kind of feel like it's the same with human beings, like, Obviously, where I would step in and say no stop to a hunter, I think we should step in and say no stop if we see someone, for example, physically hurting another person or going on a killing spree or trying to start genocide. You know what I mean? 
but if a human's just not doing something for another person, as long as they're not actively hurting them, I don't really have a problem with it. On the whole, I think, let some people have a day off every now and again, you know? For example, I don't think it would be fair to go up to a random person on the bus and say, hey, this person has organ failure. You have to give up your organs for them right now and help them. You give up a kidney for them now or else. Morally, we could say, well, yeah, you know what? The good thing to do, the morally correct thing to do is to sacrifice a spare organ to give into someone in need. But also, why should they? They're not actively causing harm, but it's also not their responsibility to give up their organ to a random person if they don't want to. And so in a similar way, I don't think we should force a person to carry another potential person inside themselves against their will. I do think it's more complicated later on in a pregnancy when the fetus has developed consciousness, sentience, the ability to feel pain. And that's why I think there should be kind of like a, a time limit in place to say, you know, no abortions after this time unless the mother's life is at risk and or, or the baby's seriously ill, whatever. So I, I'm not a supporter of all abortions, any time, right up to birth. I'm not a supporter of that. I'm a supporter of all abortions, any time, up until the fetus, you know, is conscious, sentient, blah, blah. It's all in the video with Holy Kool-Aid. But I think before the fetus becomes a conscious individual, then it's entirely up to the host what they do with what's inside their body. In your professional opinion, when, when would you say life begins? It's such a simple question with such a complicated answer. A human egg is fertilized by a sperm and that is a single cell organism that has a unique genetic makeup. That is the first. So at fertilization, you have a living cell that has that unique genetic pattern. So on that basis, human life begins at fertilization. Yeah. But a lot happens after that. It gets complicated, but I really do believe that a human life, that human life, that individual human being with that unique genetic signature starts at fertilization. So then this doctor just says like, yeah, fertilized eggs, a living cell, which is cool. Yeah, whatever, he's right. Um, but like I say, I disagree with Cole's premise that this is the only fundamental factor. So it doesn't really matter to me if a fetus is living or not. Like. I want to know the other things about it. Is it conscious, blah, 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 all that stuff that we just talk, spoke about. People think of doctors as so smart. We're no different than anyone else. When you figure out here, not here, that killing a baby this big for money is wrong, it doesn't take you too long to figure out it. It doesn't matter if the baby is this big or this big or even this big. It's all the same. I love what Dr. Levitino said that Whenever we start saying like, at what size is it a human baby? It's like, well, what size is a human a human? You know, whenever you realize that a, a baby this big, this big, and this big is a baby, it doesn't matter if it's this big or this big. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, okay, once again, I thoroughly, thoroughly disagree here because it's not a size thing. It's a development thing. Back when I tried to have a discussion about this and abortion with Cosmic Skeptic, he was an absolute douchebag who kept shouting over me and wouldn't listen to the science and he just, yeah, ooh. I deleted that video because I just felt incredibly disrespected by him and I thought he was very rude. And I don't think he ever respected me as a person and he never really saw me as an equal to him. And he didn't realize that in a lot of cases I'm a lot smarter than him. And he also said some really disgusting stuff that I cut out of that video <laughs> that bothered me. Like he said to me that as someone who has the potential to be pregnant and need an abortion, I was too emotionally invested to have a rational conversation about abortion. Bothered me. Anyway, the point is, I wasn't happy with any of that video or discussion and he just kept trying to bring it all back to the hypothetical and philosophical stuff. And he kept trying to use the sand analogy, which is basically like, oh, if you have a bunch of grains of sand, then how do you know when it becomes a pile of sand? And he kept like saying that to talk about an embryo versus a baby, like, oh, it's all just a bunch of cells. So how do you know when a bunch of cells becomes a baby? And I'm like, it's not the same. It's not the same at all because a baby isn't made up of a bunch of grains of sand. 
it's not made up of a bunch of the same kinds of cell. A baby doesn't just become a baby because it's got a certain number of cells to it. It's far more complicated like that. I say now, if you want to use an analogy, a baby is more like a burrito. You have the rice and the meat and the tortilla and the sour cream and the cheese and onions and whatever you want all laid out separately and you see them all out there and you know that's not a burrito. But they're the ingredients for a burrito. And when you start putting those ingredients together, then it becomes an, a burrito. Once you have it all wrapped up, you're like, yes, this is very clearly a burrito. But you have to understand what each ingredient is for and how you put them together in the right way in order to make the burrito, to define when it becomes a burrito. And there are certain factors where you can be like, yes, it's not a burrito unless, for example, unless the tortilla is all wrapped up, it's probably not a burrito. But if one day you want to do something like omit the cheese and put something else in there, maybe add extra jalapenos, it will be different, but it's still a burrito. And you can only define these things by understanding what each ingredient does and what its role is in the burrito. And it's the same with a baby and an embryo and a fetus and so on. It's not just a matter of, ooh, how many cells does it have? Ooh, it has 12 cells today. Now it has 300,000. Now it, it's not a matter of the number of cells because these aren't grains of sand. They're not all the same. And it's not just quantity that matters. Each of those cells is specialized and different and different types of cells are added at different times. It's not just a pile of cells, but it's cells which become tissues and then organs and then organ systems. And these things all have functions and we need to know what these functions are, when they develop and what that means for the living being. So it's not just a matter of like, oh, does it have 10 cells today or 20? It's what cells are there and what are they doing? Does it have brain cells? What are those brain cells doing? Does it have muscle cells? Does it have a heart yet? Does it have this? Does it have neurons which are picking up um, sensations like pain and so on? Does it have the mental capacity to understand that and feel it and know what's going on? Does it have sentience yet? Once you understand what each of these things do when they're added to the mix, what the functions are, what the cells are and so on, and you know these specialized bits, then yes, you absolutely can determine when an embryo becomes a baby, when it becomes an individual. And it's not just at a certain number of cells, it's when you have the appearance of certain um, organs and organ structures and when they start functioning. So in order to have this discussion, you do absolutely need to understand the human biology. You can't just stick to the hypotheticals and grain of sand analogies. A burrito is not the same as a grain of rice. A burrito is not the same as a pile of rice. And a baby is not the same as a fertilized egg. Anyway, so what this doctor's doing have been like, oh, it doesn't matter if it's dish, more dish, more. Like, that claim is disingenuous. Unless, of course, this doctor really believes that all human cells are equal, in which case I also hope he's out there protesting against weight loss, cancer treatments, amputation, skincare treatments, including cyst removal and exfoliation, haircuts, tonsil removal, removing the appendix, male masturbation. I hope he's out there actively campaigning against all of them too, because it's all the same, right? The function and ability and amount of cells being removed doesn't matter. The state of these cells doesn't matter. What matters is you're removing living cells and that's bad. That's always bad. So I really hope this man has never masturbated. Then they go on to ask how abortions are performed and the doctor they interview for this. I have an issue with this because she never discusses medical abortions or how they work, which is incredibly misleading because they are the most common type of abortion. And instead she only discusses in detail dilation and evacuation, which are not the most common form of abortion at all. And they generally only occur in women whose health is at risk or if the fetus has already died or is likely to die. So at this point, she's discussing a procedure which, at least in the UK, um, I couldn't really find stats about like how often this is done in America, so I had to use the UK stats. But in, in the UK, dilation and evacuation is mostly done on people who did want to continue their pregnancies, but couldn't for health reasons and stuff. And she describes this in the most vile way possible and misses out a lot of very important details. And I just think it's cruel and misleading and inaccurate. And 
the only reason she's trying to portray all abortions like this is to be harmful. So, I'll warn you now, what she's about to say is pretty disgusting, but after she's done, we're going to talk through the actual process of how most abortions are carried out. So I feel like a lot of people watching or listening might not know how abortions are performed, you know? I, I think the you, you hear pro-choice and it sounds right because it's like, oh, well, the mother should be able to decide whether to keep or not keep, but they don't understand what not keep means. Well, most people don't realize it, but any OBGYN has to learn how to do abortions in their residency program. You can opt out because of conscience, but I didn't because I was really very pro-abortion. I had had an abortion myself, and I didn't think any woman should have to bear a child she didn't want. In our training program, we learned how to do first trimester abortions, but I was so gung-ho that I went outside of the program and got one of the local abortionists to show me how to do D and E abortions, which are also known as dismemberment abortions, where you literally take the baby apart piece by piece to remove it from the uterus. In the first trimester, that involves um, putting some local anesthetic in the cervix, and after you have the opening large enough, you insert a little tube, and you go around just like a little vacuum cleaner and suck out the suck out the pregnancy and the, the, the baby is sort of torn apart as it's going through the hole because it's bigger than the hole and then the placenta goes through and then you check to make sure there's nothing left and that's the end. Yeah. And then for second trimester it's a little bit more involved. Oftentimes you have to um, dilate the cervix ahead of time because if you try to mechanically dilate the cervix, it can lead to damage to the cervix. Then you just reach in with a heavy duty clamp and grab whatever you can grab, uh, an arm or a leg usually. And as you're pulling it through the cervix, the body's too big, so it's not gonna come and so with enough traction and twisting, the arm or the leg comes off. And you do that until you've got everything you can. And then you have to reach up and try to crush the bigger parts, so like the chest um, and eventually the head. And then you just bring them out in, in pieces. Um, you can tell when you've, when you've crushed the head because the white brains leak out. So in the UK, 94% of abortions take place before 13 weeks of pregnancy, which is 11 weeks of fetal development. 94%, remember that. And in America, it's almost 93% of them. So this means the fetus, at the very latest possible stage, at this 13 week mark, is less than three inches long. Usually it's a lot smaller, usually it's a tiny bundle of cells. Um, and at this stage, medical abortions are the most common type of abortion. In the UK, around 85% of all abortions carried out in total, so not just this 94%, but all of them are medical abortions. The stats are a little bit harder to find in America, but it seems closer to around 50% of all abortions being medical. Um, I'm not sure why there's a discrepancy between the UK and America. I don't know why the UK seems to prefer medical abortions, whereas America is more 50-50, but there are some reasons why medical abortions aren't possible for every woman. And I think a lot of it is to do with like it interfering with other medic medications that people are on or potential allergic reactions or stuff like that. So maybe that's why surgical options are more common in America. I don't know, I couldn't quite find the information on it, but here we are. So while we're discussing medical abortions, there are two different kinds of these mostly, and they usually involve taking two pills and then the pregnancy kind of passes like a bad period. So up to 10 weeks of pregnancy, you can take mifepristone, which blocks your body from producing the hormone progesterone. And by blocking this hormone, it stops an embryo from either implanting in the uterus lining or being able to grow anymore. So it stops the cells from multiplying. This is then followed up by a second tablet called misoprostol, which basically causes your uterus to contract. It basically starts a period, so your body sheds its uterine lining and any fertilized egg or 
egg cells or embryos in there. At this point, the embryo will be so small, you likely won't even see it. Um, it's only an inch long at 10 weeks, and this type of abortion is usually carried out before then, so you're talking something tiny, 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 tiny. So small, you won't even notice it's there. The other thing to note is that misoprostol is commonly given to women who have miscarried but haven't yet passed the, the miscarried embryo. So this is a medicine not just given for abortions, but to help people with miscarriages as well, and a whole bunch of other uses. Uh, the other type of medical abortion is to take a methotrexate and, again, misoprostol. And this can be given in the first seven weeks of pregnancy, so even sooner, when the embryo is even smaller and less developed. The first pill stops the embryo from multiplying anymore, and the second pill, same as before, causes the uterus to contract. Again, methotrexate has a, another use as well in that it's used in cancer treatments to stop cancer cells from multiplying. So the same treatment to stop cancer cells from multiplying is given to stop an embryo from multiplying. It's the same process. It stops non-sentient cells which would continue to grow from multiplying anymore. It stops them from growing and causing more harm. The other types of abortion are surgical abortion and they account for the 15% of abortions in the UK and 50% in America. There are three different types of surgical abortions. One of them is vacuum aspiration and in most countries you can have this between 12 and 16 weeks of pregnancy um, but in America it can also happen before as well and it's kind of an alternative to medical abortions. And um, This sounds scary but it, it's really not so bad. At this point, the potential fetus is around three to four inches long, maximum, usually considerably smaller. And the, the, the baby is sort of torn apart as it's going through the hole because it's bigger than the hole. And remember at this point, not many abortions are taking place. Remember in the UK and America, 93 to 94% of abortions take place before the 13 week mark. So at this point when the fetus is three to four inches big, we're talking like a couple of percentages of abortions happening at this point. It's not that many. And at this point, the embryo can't feel pain. It has no consciousness, no sentience, no developed brain as we know a brain to be. It's no different from removing any other type of cell. And basically what happens is a small vacuum is inserted into the uterus and it's used to sh suck out the uterine lining the embryo and placenta. It's not painful for either the person getting the abortion or the embryo, which doesn't have the ability to feel pain until 28 to 30 weeks into growth. And this is happening way, way, way before then, maximum 16 weeks. Another type of surgical abortion is the one that this doctor mentioned in the video and it's called dilation and evacuation. She makes it sound like this is the most common type of abortion, this is what every abortion is, but it's really, really, really not. I can't find any specific DNA stats, but according to the CDC in 2019, 7% of all abortions were surgical and over 13 weeks. That's in America. So only a percentage of those will be DNA at all. Some of those will be vacuum aspirations, some will be the next kind we'll look at. So it's really not common at all. And in the UK, this is only allowed after a certain point as well. So this is mostly used in the UK on women who the fetus isn't viable, the fetus is gonna have health conditions, or if continuing the pregnancy is gonna put the mother's life in danger. So please remember that while this doesn't sound like the nicest procedure, it's not being done on conscious or sentient babies. It's not being done on embryos or fetuses that can feel any pain. It's not being done on any that can survive outside the womb. And generally, especially in the UK, it's not being done just for the fun of it because, oh, fancied an abortion this week. This is generally a last resort for a lot of people in this situation. The only exception is um, either people who found out very, very late that they were pregnant and didn't realise before, or the people who struggled to get easy access to abortion early on. So this is like people in America who they can't get abortions in their state and they have to save up money and travel out of state and then save up a bunch more money to afford the abortion and blah, blah, blah. And they have to travel far. They don't have easy access to abortion. So they have to wait until it's late on to get an abortion because they had no other choice. Either that or, like I say, they're having to choose to end their pregnancy because it poses serious health risks to them, or if they continue their pregnancy, it would result in serious debilitating health problems for the baby. Again, it's not a nice method of abortion, but it is necessary for some. And if you do want to reduce the number of these kinds of abortions happening, especially in America, then make access to abortion, especially early abortion, easier, cheaper, 
more nearby, affordable, safer, legal, all, all these things. So basically a DE procedure involves a doctor dilating your cervix and using forceps and a vacuum aspirator to remove the fetus and placenta from the uterus. And then a little curette is used to remove the rest of the uterine lining. It just means things are manually taken from the body. Like this can be painful for the person getting the abortion. So pain relief is provided to the pregnant person. But at this point, at this stage in pregnancy, there is no evidence to suggest that the fetus being removed can feel any pain. And the idea of having like a fetus physically removed from the body and, you know, forceps picking out your placenta, that might sound horrible, it might sound a little bit gross, but it's no worse than any other medical procedure which involves tissue being removed from the body. I don't know if you've ever watched any videos of medical procedures, I know I had to like back when I was at uni and stuff, but having watched a lot of fairly graphic surgical videos and all sorts of stuff, like it is all very manual, there's a lot of pulling and clamping and cutting and slicing and scraping and that's how things are removed from the body, that's how surgery is done on the body and it might sound horrible to put it in terms like that where they're like oh and then you grab this piece of tissue and you pull it here and you cut this here and you scrape this here, it sounds horrible when you put it like that but that's how all surgery is done and with all good surgeons this will be done efficiently and respectfully and carefully. The way this woman describes it in this video is not likely to be accurate and is simply scaremongering and I find it particularly sickening because as I mentioned before, few people who have this procedure actually want it and it's usually done as a last resort because they have no other options. And so to talk about it in this way, to shame the people having to have it done in this way, to make it seem like this barbaric thing, it just seems unnecessarily cruel to me. And then the final type of surgical abortion is an induction abortion and these are incredibly, incredibly, incredibly rare. And these are one of the only options after 24 weeks of pregnancy. So again, in the UK, these aren't done on anyone just because they ask for an abortion. These are only done in life-saving situations. And again, they're still very, very rare in America. So these are generally only done if the mother's life is at risk or the child will be born with a debilitating illness or deformity and I believe this is the exact same procedure they use to deliver stillborns. So basically the mother and fetus are given pain relief and then given medicine to induce early labour and the woman has to deliver the fetus vaginally at this point because it is quite big, 24 weeks a fairly big fetus. The thing is the way many pro-lifers describe this is they make it sound like super common and like this is happening all the time and people are just delivering healthy babies and then the babies are slaughtered on the spot that's never happened. That's never ever happened. I'm gonna keep saying it, these kinds of abortions are generally only used on people whose personal health is at serious risk if they continue their pregnancy or if the baby would be born with serious health conditions or if the fetus is likely to die anyway if the pregnancy continues. So if they're already dead, dying or suffering. If the baby is still alive when this kind of abortion is performed then the doctor will generally give it an injection which basically painlessly puts it to sleep, which is basically euthanasia. Because like I say, this fetus is already likely to be suffering and in pain and it's basically just euthanizing it so it stops suffering. Again, this isn't pleasant, but it's generally a last resort for people and the people who have to go through this kind of abortion, it's not some fun game for them. They're likely gonna suffer a lot of trauma from it and I don't think it's fair to shame those people anymore and to make them feel worse than they already do. A lot of these people wanted to keep their babies and simply couldn't and I don't think it's fair to make them feel bad about that. When I say serious health condition I don't just mean like oh look that baby has a finger missing or oh look that baby has down syndrome. Like no, they're all things where the baby can still go on to live a happy normal healthy life. They're absolutely fine. I mean serious problems like if the pregnancy continues that baby is gonna die inside the mother anyway or if the pregnancy continues it might cause the mother to die in the process of delivering the baby or if it is born it's not going to live more than a few hours or days and that period will likely be spent in severe pain. I'm sorry if this sounds disgusting now but the case studies I read of like these kinds of abortions being having, having to be carried out on fetuses at this stage were because things like the baby had whole organs missing, the baby had a physical hole in its skull where its brain was exposed, the baby didn't have a fully developed brain, 
um, the baby had severe heart disease, all these really, really awful things where it had no chance at all. It's never an easy decision for anyone to decide to abort a fetus at any stage, and especially for parents like this who clearly wanted the baby, but it was just too ill to survive or it was putting their own life at risk. It's never going to be an easy decision for them, and I think it's incredibly cruel to judge people for having to make those difficult choices. So, yeah, the whole conversation around what is abortion, how does it happen, why does it happen, how does it work, what happens during an abortion, it is far more complex than the Lebrants presented in this video, and what they did present in this video was blatant scaremongering misinformation. And then it flips back to this doctor who's like, yeah, I worked with high-risk pregnancies and some of those people are okay, so we should make everyone continue with high-risk pregnancies, which is just stupid. Um, then he makes this bizarre claim. The vast majority of times that a pregnancy becomes dangerous to a woman with m many of these conditions, there are a few cases early in pregnancy, we can talk about those, but the vast, vast, vast number of these cases occur after 22 weeks when the baby's viable. I have termin as a pro-life obstetrician gynecologist and almost 10 years of experience in a tertiary medical center, I have terminated, i.e. ended, hundreds of pregnancies to save women's lives. How many babies did I have to deliberately kill in the process? None, not even one. It's called delivery. Again, this is absolutely misleading, like I said. Most of these cases of late-term abortions, which like I'm gonna keep saying, late-term abortions are so, so rare and the exception to the rule, but most of them aren't just, oh, it's a bit of preeclampsia, which can be serious, but we generally want something we can deal with and to look out for and whatever. But like, sometimes the health problems are way more severe and it's not just a matter of, oh, power through, oh, we have some medicine to help you get through it. You'll probably be fine. If a fetus has severe abnormalities and health conditions, for example, it's missing half a brain, it doesn't have a fully formed skull, it doesn't have an entire organ or something like that. If that pregnancy is going to continue just for that child to suffer and die, do you think the kindest thing, really, is to tell that person carrying that baby that they have to continue the pregnancy and they have to carry around that baby until it dies in her? Do you really think that's the kindest thing for anyone involved? Or, or you tell them that they have to carry that baby and let it feel pain, let it suffer, and let it live out its short life, probably a matter of days, in intensive care and intense pain. That's not kind for anyone. I don't think that's fair at all, and I think this man is being incredibly misleading in him saying, oh yeah, we can fix preeclampsia, there's no need for any of these late-term abortions. Like, that's not what it is at all. Sometimes late-term abortions are needed to save a mother's life, and to say otherwise is a blatant lie. Uh, then there's a personal story from one of these mothers who was adopted as a kid, and she's just like, oh, you don't need to abort, just adopt. Which, fair enough, I wish more people would adopt instead of having kids of their own, but I think it's completely naive to say that forcing people to continue with a pregnancy and just give their baby up for adoption is an option for everyone. There are many, many reasons why people don't want to continue with pregnancy. It's not just that they don't want to have a baby at the end of it, it's that they don't want to be pregnant. For one, pregnancy takes extreme toll on the body and not everyone should have to go through that if they don't want to. Two, there are plenty of medications that you can't take while pregnant and some people don't want to stop taking them and risk their own health just to continue with a pregnancy that they don't want anyway. Uh, three, some people can't afford to take time off work while they're pregnant um, and to give birth and after the birth to recover. Pregnancy takes a lot of toll on the body and you can't always work through that and not everyone can afford to take the time off work. Four, especially if you're in America or a country with a screwed up healthcare system, all the pregnancy, healthcare and actual giving birth and having to go to hospital and all that stuff can be insanely expensive and not everyone can afford to do that. Why force them? And number five, you know that number they put on screen in the beginning for the number of abortions performed per year? Now let's imagine all of those babies were actually born. How are they all fitting into our already underfunded, overworked hospitals? Where are they living? 
uh, where are all the new healthcare workers and social workers and teachers coming from who are going to look after them? Where are all their parents? Where are all these foster parents? Who is funding all of this? Where are the new care homes being built? Where are the new hospitals being built? Who is paying for them? Uh, where are all the new schools that they're going to? Who's training all the new teachers that they're going to need? Who is paying to feed them and clothe them and provide their healthcare for the first 18 years of their lives? Because you do need to think about this. You can't just suddenly say, oh, we're going to introduce millions of new people into the population and they can all be adopted, it's fine. Because no, where are they going to live? Who's going to support them and who's paying for it all? It sounds heartless, but you do need to think about these things. Because this isn't just hypothetical, this isn't just, ooh, save a few lives. No, then you have the lives and you think, how are you gonna look after them? How are you gonna stop them growing up in poverty? How are you gonna stop them growing up malnourished and ill and suffering and unloved? And then Cole does this whole ridiculous thing of, oh my God, if my mum had an abortion, then I wouldn't be here. And if I wasn't here, then my daughters wouldn't be here. So abortion is bad. So here's a crazy thought. I would not be here today if my grandma did not choose life for my mom. As a matter of fact, her story is wild. I sat down with her to talk about it. You're about to hear it, but her story is so beautiful because it shows the generational impact of choosing, yes, I'm gonna keep this baby. My grandma did not decide to keep my mom. Not only would I not be here, but my kids wouldn't be here. And one day, my kids' kids, and my kids' kids' kids, and so on. Saying yes to keeping your baby affects so much more than you could ever imagine. Which is entirely ridiculous and it's absolute crap logic because if you never existed then you wouldn't know and you wouldn't be aware of it and there wouldn't be any loss really would it? But if you're gonna go down this route then I hope he also cries every time he ejaculates because oh my god think about all those sperm cells that don't end in pregnancy Think about all those children he's just wasted. Oh my god, what about their children? Their children's children? Their children's children's children? My god, it's such a waste. I hope he mourns every time his wife gets a period because that's a waste of a potential life too, isn't it? And I mean, how do you make this logic fit with other people as well? Like, what if Hitler's mother had been considered an abortion? Would he still be sat there thinking, and thank God she didn't get an abortion because otherwise we wouldn't have Adolf Hitler? Isn't abortion bad? This logic doesn't work. Then they're like, oh, women only have abortions because they're scared. We just need to make them not scared by praying for them. And then there's some other stuff. And I actually have no problem with them supporting women who are scared and need support during pregnancy. All that sounds great, wonderful, do support that stuff. But you can do all of that without spreading misinformation about abortion and discouraging abortion in the first place and shaming the people who do need them and choose them and undermining their reasons for it. Uh, then there's a the story of a woman who got pregnant at an inconvenient time and she still went through with the pregnancy and had a ton of support and yay, great, good for her, glad she made the right choice for her, but how about we don't forget about all the people who aren't in her situation, the ones who are forced to continue with pregnancies and regret it and it does ruin their lives. What about all the people who get abortions and say it's the best thing that ever happened to them? Because all of those people exist too. It's about making the right informed choice for you and the law and social and healthcare systems need to support all different kinds of people and their needs. And that's why it's important that we have safe, accessible, affordable and legal abortion and proper education around these topics so that people can make the right decision for them. This woman says, you can have your baby and your dreams too, but like, no, not everyone can because take me, for example, as a child-free woman, all of my dreams involve not being pregnant, not having a baby, not doing any of that to my body. So how can I have my dreams and a baby? They're literally polar opposites. I just, I, <sighs> I know a lot of these people are trying to be encouraging and mean like, yeah, there's options for everyone, there's support out there, which is great but you forget that not everyone has the same dreams, not everyone wants the same things. To force a pregnancy on someone like me is literally taking my future away from me. It's taking away everything I've ever wanted. It's making me hate myself and want to die. And I think they forget that some people have that mindset. Just how I find it hard to fathom how anyone could want a baby in their life, they seem to find it hard to fathom that anyone could not want a baby. But the difference is, while I sit here and say, and you know what, if you want kids, good for you, you go for it. I will pay my taxes and support healthcare and social care and education to make sure you get to make the choices that you want, but they won't do the same for people like me. 
and that's a huge problem. This whole thing of like, you can have your baby and your dreams too, it's like saying to someone, you can eat whatever you want as long as it includes this steak right here. What, what do you mean you're a vegetarian? It doesn't matter, look, I'm giving you the choice of everything as long as it includes a steak. That's freedom, right? You're getting everything you want, including this thing that you really, really don't want that I'm forcing on you. The question we get faced with a lot when we talk about this is you only care about life inside the womb. What about life outside the womb? And, and I agree with that question. I think it's a very valid question. And it's a question that, that it makes us look into ourselves and say, what are we doing for the life outside the womb? Because there is so much. Um, you know, there's an overburdened foster care system. There's homelessness and there's all this stuff. And um, the list goes on and on and on and on. And fortunately, we got to participate in an event called One Day LA. Okay, and this bit here is a fantastic question. I think it's so, so great to see some self-awareness from them. I'm very glad they're asking this. Unfortunately, their answer is just, well, we did this one day of charity work in this one state, so that solves it all, right? It doesn't. It absolutely doesn't. And it's just, it, it's not enough. They're not thinking this stuff through, and it's not a good enough answer for me. It ends with the story of a woman whose medical abortion failed, and now she's like, yay, baby, and then that's pretty much it. So, overall, I think this video is bad, and it is harmful. And what's really scary is that this isn't the only piece of misinformation out there. What I found every time I've done a video on abortion, I've done a lot of research and stuff, is that every time you Google any of this stuff, there is so much misinformation and propaganda and fear-mongering out there. There is so much blatantly lying to people about what actually happens in abortions and the signs around them and all this stuff, more so than with most topics I cover on my channel. And sometimes you look at a website and it's really hard to tell what you can trust and what you can't. With books, it's hard to tell what you can trust and what you can't. And so, by making this video and my other videos on abortion related topics, hopefully this is going to at least go a little of the way to correcting some of the misinformation out there and hopefully I'm doing a little bit of good in the world. At least that's the goal. The LeBrants have over 13 million subscribers and their abortion documentary has been viewed at this moment over three and a half million times. So while I'm small and insignificant in comparison with them, I hope that I can make even a little bit of difference in correcting the harm that they've done by making this video. And I thoroughly encourage you all to go out, do your own research, thoroughly understand what is being spoken about here and make up your own minds and ultimately respect that other people have the right to choose what happens to their own bodies and the kind, loving thing to do is to support that and allow people safe access to the medical treatments that they need if they need it. <sighs> but with that in mind, I've been talking a hell of a long time today. I know this is a very emotional topic for a lot of people, so I will say, if you're gonna leave a comment, please be respectful of the other people in the comment section, please be kind, and uh, please just treat each other with a little bit of dignity and respect, please. But for now, that's me done. Thank you for watching today. I know this was long, but thank you for taking the time to come on this little journey with me and listen to me rant. And I, I know it's been a little bit intense, but thank you so much. And I'll see you again really soon.